Thank you very much for inviting me. You may wonder, why do we have to listen to a historian now? It's all in the past. And the C CEO who introduced um, this gathering said, what we really need to think about is what's next. And that's true, that's true. But in a way, that's what history is about. <laughs> um, past societies have constantly wondered what will be next. And then we forget about it because it becomes normalized and we treat it as if it's always been like that. But we're effectively, when we're thinking about what's going to be next, we're not fundamentally um, that different from what previous societies had to go through. So the past, in fact, can be um, illuminating because it can show us how some of the pathways we think we take for granted were really radical shifts. And if there were radical shifts in the past, perhaps we may uh, face radical shifts um, as, as well. Um, I think the discussion uh, we've been having um, in between the previous sessions are quite interesting because a lot of the answers, whether they're for eco-modernism or whether they're for eco-socialism, in the tables boil down to certain human characteristics. So, Humans seem to be really bright, but ultimately, um, they also seem to be a um, little bit lazy. <laughs> and that combination is n maybe in human nature, but how this plays itself out is not a constant. There have been fundamental shifts, and I'm going to um, introduce a few of those to you. So to get us started, um, just cast your mind back to the end of the 19th century, where one of the founding fathers of psychology, um, and also a philosopher, William James, was considering the nature of human identity. And um, he said, well, you know, there are lots of things we actually know about human identity. We have a personal identity. We have a sense of who we are. But that's not just about our our, ourselves as individuals, we also have a social identity, he pointed out. So, family, friends, enemies, they're part of our identity as well. It's not just self-directed. But then he said, what previous thinkers have been missing is a third component. And he called it the material self. And he gave this very nice definition um, that a man's self, and a woman's as well, is the sum total of all that he can call his. The clothes he's wearing, his house, his lands and horses, yacht and bank account. I'm not sure whether uh, James ever visited Cun, but the yachts, I always have to explain to people, but we're in an area where that's sort of self-explanatory out there. And he says, you know, these are, these, these, these are personal possessions and they're not separate from a person's identity, but they become part of his material self. And if they expand, they give people the emotions of growth, personal growth and, and, and development. But if they decline, people get depressed. Um, and so there's this material self he points out. Um, now, it would be an interesting exercise for each of us to think, okay, if we agree that he's right, what are the things in our lives which are absolutely crucial to who we think we are? I think we could probably each come up with a list that are quite important. Now, you may think, oh, well, that's sort of very academic, but actually, this is a very, very important truth, and we know it um, because um, if you have um, elderly parents who, say, have to move out of their house to go to a care home, it's an often a very traumatic experience because they can't take all their things. And so suddenly, there are all these items, um, a present given by the daughter, or something, a trinket, absolutely valueless in commercial terms, but on the first holiday to Spain, taken back. And it's always been standing on the same table, and the ta same table now doesn't fit into the care home. Uh, so people feel something from their selves is being lost. Now, it sounds, I, th I hope, or I think, it still sounds like a valid analysis of the human psyche. So you may want, wonder, how did 
um, humans, who are not stupid, how, how could it possibly have taken until 1890 for someone to become famous with this insight? Isn't this self-evident? And it's not. And in the past, it was not self-evident. So to give you a stark contrast, let's move to Florence um, in the Renaissance at the end of the 15th century, where in 1497, in the uh, uh, Piazza della Signoria, you can see a painting there. The Dominican uh, preacher and hothead, Savonarola, went out into the square and called on all citizens to give up luxury goods they had in their homes. And they piled them up in the middle of the square, oriental carpets, beautiful paintings, um, expensive musical instruments, fine books, silk garments, and they piled them all up and set them on fire. And if you didn't do that, you were branded and marked out as a not very virtuous Fiorentine uh, citizen. This is not, I mean, the bonfire of the vanities, as it became known, uh, didn't happen everywhere, but the general opposition and efforts to punish the pursuit of personal possessions was the dominant school and in place across Europe in this period. You had so-called sumptuary laws, um, which laid down exactly who could wear what, who could consume what, um, by status um, and background. Um, could you wear fine red silk? Well, probably not if you're not a cardinal. How big could your carriage be? How many horses would you be allowed to have? Could you, as an artisan, invest in fine, um, uh, fine gilded or silver um, items at home if you're not a, ma a master of the guild? So you had all these restrictions, and they worked. They can be all, I think, summarized, um, the spirit behind them, with the idea that things are outside the human psyche or the human soul, and they're dangerous temptations. You have to keep them at bay. If you want to be pure, whether from a spiritual point of view, so Christianity, or from a political point of view, a good upstanding citizen, you had to control and discipline these temptations. Because once you had too many things, you would be corrupted, you would be spoiled, you would be lazy. And if you're lazy and spoiled, you can't defend your community against enemies. It goes all the way back to Plato, this general suspicion that we need to keep things at bay because they are polluting some authentic self. Now, James says, well, actually, things are part of the self. So he, he in a way, opened the doors um, to the human psyche or self and said, let the things in. They help us uh, become um, better, um, more cultured individuals. So we have a massive change in the ways people see themselves in relation to goods. Um, so you have these bonfires, but you also have strict punishments. So into the early 19th century, if you were a woman in southern Germany, so just across the border from France, and you were seen in the street with fashionable printed Indian cotton shawls or blouses, well, you're going to be thrown for a month into, in, into the local prison. Now, that's not an invitation to consumption, I can assure you. So we had major pressures that were keeping a lid on how much we could consume. How did this change? How did we get from this situation, uh, sort of strong opposition, to a kind of embrace where things are good? Uh, let's look at a few uh, central dynamics. Now, I've selected here for you four items um, from different parts of the world, um, which give you a sense of shifts in consumption. The, um, on your right, this is this, a stoneware uh, bottle from Europe around 1600. This is what Europeans, relatively well-off Europeans, would have as the main vessel uh, for liquid and water. Stoneware, very rough, not very pretty. This is on the right, on your left, 
um, you have, um, same time period, you have what Chinese people had, and not just rich Chinese people. We know from archaeological finds and graves that farmers, um, so lower urban, lower middle class, would have fine porcelain bottles glazed, printed with images on it, smooth. Hugely important because um, fine porcelain can keep heat much better than, than this, this sort of item, which is important if you want to have hot coffee or hot tea, which are gradually being imported in, into Europe. Europeans are trying to emulate porcelain. They're constantly um, wasting uh, huge amounts of money and ruining their kingdoms in the search for the pattern for porcelain. The best they can come up with is this, what's called jasper ware. It's an imitation of, of porcelain by, by Wedgwood. And then from Latin America, you have this silver marchi uh, cup uh, with a bombilla, a, a straw. Now, let me ask you, I mean, they're obviously different colors and different uh, finery and value, but what do these items have in common? I'm sorry? Yeah, and what do you use them for? Drinking. Drinking. Just you yourself or? With some others. These are all items for sociability. Think of the tea party that is becoming popular in this period, or people meeting for coffee. The marchi, the bombilla, is not for just an individual, it's to be shared in the group. Now that's important because it tells us that the rise in consumption doesn't necessarily have um, uh, to do with individual desire. I want more, or something like that. It actually has a lot to do with new social spaces, new forms of social interaction, people using consumption to tie um, social networks. And one reason for the uh, massive expansion in the Netherlands and Britain, sort of the, the vanguard of this expansion, is that you had highly urbanized middle-class communities in those, uh, in those countries who are using this new form of sociability as a way to say, we're not like the aristocracy. The aristocracy does luxury. They're selfish. We're middle class. We're sober. We're drinking tea and coffee. We are good consumers. And suddenly consumption can be something positive because you're using it to cement your status. There are other factors um, which uh, um, I, just can, I can just scratch, which are important in this positive upgrading of stuff Cities are hugely important here, and we've heard how we've seen now um, the expansion of cities in many other parts of the world, but it's important not just because it, cities offer spaces for consumption, right? If you want to have a fashionable store, you better be in a city than somewhere in the middle of nowhere in the countryside, but also because cities, of course, people come together and observe each other's behavior, and they emulate each other's behavior, and they learn new habits. So cities are kinds of schools of uh, new consumption behavior. Urbanization is one big driver um, that helps it. Um, the second is a kind of intellectual new appreciation of what consumption can do. And here, 18th century philosophers and economic writers like Hume, David Hume, and Adam Smith are hugely important because they suddenly turn this uh, suspicion against consumption around and are saying, well, consumption, yes, it includes luxury goods and luxury trades, clothing, um, fine leatherware, and so forth, but actually these places em employ people. And luxury trades are hugely competitive, so there's space there for technological innovation. So instead of uh, decrying it, we should actually encourage it, because it drives the economy forward. If the economy is driven forward, we're growing, that means we can actually defend ourselves against the French. Always a good thing, if you're in Britain, to defend yourself against the French. Um, and so by 1776, in, uh, when he writes The Wealth of Nation, Adam Smith states that actually all production has only one end, and that is to satisfy consumption. 
So consumption is no longer seen as a waste, but as a gain. And that becomes entrenched, so in the next century, you then have ordinary people standing up as consumers and saying, well, we're actually important. You can't just ignore us. We are the national interest. We are the public interest. What we do is creating work for others. So you have a tremendous positive uh, 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 transformation that helps to make consumption the normal good way of doing things. This is never entirely a peaceful story. So, um, tea from India, um, coffee uh, from the New World, tobacco and so forth, is entangled in, imperial, um, uh, in imperialism, um, in colonial subjugation, in a lot of pain, including the slave trade and so forth. Um, but it creates a new kind of value system where exotic things have value. The more distance, the better. Um, and that's one reason why sugar, coffee, and tea become just so central. Only a few people had actually been to these places in the 16th or 17th century. They come back with these new unknown goods. Novelty is suddenly uh, has value. Whereas in China, at the same time, it's antiquity that has value. The Chinese look at European imports. Um, Euro European traders say, hey, we've got some new stuff here, new products you've never seen before. And they look at it and say, well, why do we need this new stuff? This looks like children's toys, little gadgets. No, no, we want something that's 2,000 years old. That has value. In Europe, a new regime gains ground where Novelty is prized. Now, in the late 19th century, you have an interesting shift. Um, so the height of imperialism, um, where these exotic goods, which had value because they came from plantations far away and you had pictures of palm trees and so forth, are rebranded. And I've put up some, some examples to give you a sense of what that looked like. So, Jeanne d'Arc, suddenly, chocolate. French chocolate. Cocoa beans, not really grown in France. Um, you have English sailors talking about the good old English cocoa. You know, no cocoa beans in, in Lancashire, I can assure you. Um, Finland promotes coffee as a national product with the Paula girl, um, one of my favorites. Um, still going on this competition, so if you're Finnish and you're ambitious and you're pretty, you can um, enter to be the next Paula girl and travel across the country in a nice costume, only in Finland. And the Germans, um, you know, they go for a slightly different style. Um, uh, you have uh, Arminius. Um, I sat at a table with some Germans, so here comes, here comes um, your old, your Latin or history teacher um, will now look, look from perhaps the grave. Who's Arminius? Okay, okay, okay. Well, perhaps there is something to be said for artificial intelligence. Um, Arminius, Arminius is uh, also known as Hermann uh, uh, the Etruscan. He's the one who beats the Romans in the Teutoburg Forest a few years um, uh, after Christ's birth um, with a brilliant German uh, uh, military strategy of hiding in the oak trees and then jumping out of the trees on, onto the Roman, Roman legions. But the Teutoburg Forest, I can, I can tell you, doesn't grow coffee. <laughs> Um, so suddenly, these goods, there's a new value system. These are no longer distant and exotic. They're meant to be democratic for everyone within your nation state. Now, these are the drivers behind consumption. I want to say a few words about um, how um, contingent the direction uh, that consumption take is at certain uh, places and that we shouldn't think that, well, it's all just set and there's a trajectory and people just follow it. Uh, there were times where you had major interventions that changed lifestyles. And here again, it's not desire which is crucial, um, it's habits, ways of living which just appear normal. And so um, here on the right, 
from um, uh, West Germany in 1960, you have a wonderful scene of three teenagers having a great time in one of the girls' um, uh, rooms. And you can see all sorts of other consumer um, items, uh, sort of pop stars, film stars, record player, um, etc., etc. This is only possible because of changes in heating technology. Before 1960, most people in West Germany, um, children, teenagers, had a room for sleeping. It was not heated. Not a great place to hang out with your friends <laughs> or to study. Um, so new heating technology and ultimately central heating opens up spaces um, for new personal and social use. Or to put it very, very quickly, um, one of my um, grand ideas, no teenage culture without change in heating. If there hadn't been new heating technology, we wouldn't, we wouldn't have this problem with all these teenagers. Um, so so th that, that sort of alerts us to how much in the way we consume lies in a, in a way behind the scenes. We just don't think about it. We are so preoccupied with products, marketing, advertising, but often the spaces for those are created by other surrounding, a kind of ecosystem that lies behind it. Infrastructure is hugely important. Um, you can also have direct interventions that change the way um, entire societies live their lives and consume. And that happened in Japan in the interwar years, where you had a, um, a life reform movement, a mass movement, which is sponsored by the state, has the support of architects and engineers, and crucially, women's clubs. There's a network of women's clubs in most neighborhoods in Japanese cities. And the goal is, this is from one of their posters, um, the goal is that you want to move from the present, this is the present, dirty, smoke-filled kitchen, uh, people working on the ground, um, to the new world. Modern appliances, gas, electricity, people standing up. This is, a, this is only the kitchen. They applied this also to the living room, where Husband and wife now shared the same space where children were allowed to play. And ultimately, this promoted a kind of Western-looking apartment layout, um, which replaced the traditional Japanese home. Now, I'm not saying um, this reform was 100% successful. If you go to Japan, you will still notice, oh, there's some differences here in this culture. But at the same time, um, if someone asks you, you will also notice, wow, there are lots of similarities, actually, if you look at apartments, for instance, how people live in their apartments. Um, so this is sort of a, an example of how we should think less about individual relations to the market and a little bit more to how, at crucial moments, civil society, state, and economic actors can, can interact um, for change. Now, one last um, thing to uh, get you uh, thinking. Where's this all heading? So that was the past. Where's this all heading? There's been a lot of talk about dematerialization, the idea that, well, this is the past, but we've turned a corner. People are no longer interested in so many things. They share. They share all sorts of things. Airbnb, car sharing, and, and all that sort of stuff. And they love experiences. We hear about the experience economy. People don't want to, we're told, people don't any longer want to possess anything. They just want to enjoy and share. There's some truth to that. Airbnb, car sharing comes to mind. But there's also a lot of counter evidence. This is um, the pictures you see there. That's a sort of physical reminder um, that a lot of the things we think of uh, as experiences or shared stuff um, which require um, laptops, computers, all sorts of IT equipments, come with a material side to it. Um, we just don't like to think about it. We have our laptop, but that's not possession. <laughs> you know, possession is what our parents and grandparents had. Uh, but I think we need to recognize this multiplication of objects in our lives, which is still material. And I end with a note on the experience, the idea that this is something new. 
I can assure you, between 1500 and yesterday, people partly consumed four experiences. The department store, they didn't just go there to buy an item, they wanted to be wowed by all the stuff on display. Early cinema, you know, one of the main items um, of spending for working class people, cinema is not about owning something, it's about having a great time. Think of the explosion of commercial sport in the years around 1900, all the football clubs now, um, go back to that time. There was plenty of experiences. It's, I think, wrong to think of experience or stuff. In the past, most people have combined stuff with experiences. Thank you. Thank you.